What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mastermind, how to start a Pokemon card company in 2023. My name is Brian, and I made a 42-slide presentation for you. Uh, number one, credibility. How am I credible to talk to y'all about this? Uh, well, we've done $2.5 million in sales in the last two years. $1.8 million was on our main site. I've got that on the screen for you. And the other sites you can read about, I'm not going to post every screenshot for every sale. Uh, we've also been featured on Vice News, NHK, which is like Japanese public service television. It's basically Japanese PBS. And uh, a couple other places, 60 Second Docs. They're kind of cool. So we've been seen by several million people. So, credible. All right, section one, getting an LLC. Do you even need one? The answer is no. You can also be a sole proprietor. We're going to go over both of those things. So an LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, it is something completely separated from you as a human that means your llc would do its own taxes it'll have its own bank account its own uh costs and income and it also has some perks so if you mow lawns for a living and you hit a rock with your lawnmower and the rock hits a dog and kills it or hey maybe you run over the dog with your lawnmower the owner will probably want to sue you so they're going to sue your company because you were doing business under your llc the worst thing that can happen is they take all your company's assets which sucks but your family's good, your house is good, your cars, anything that belongs to you as a normal human, completely protected because you are completely separate from your company. That's the li limited liability section, the LL of an LLC. Um, with an LLC, uh, you're going to need a separate bank account. You're gonna, you can't commingle assets. To me, that is all easier i'd rather have a separate bank account checking accounts are free you might even get like a toaster by signing up for a checking account like aunt may did or didn't do anyway uh yeah it costs like 700 to 900 bucks depending on your state to set one up with an attorney if you want to do it yourself i think it's damn near free you might need to pay some fees here and there but that's very challenging uh there are websites such as like legal zoom kind of like a turbo tax of llc's uh it's still gonna cost you like 200 plus dollars and to me i'm not smart enough to do that i tried it it was confusing i'd rather just pay i paid my guy 600 bucks and he set up a whole binder for me of all sorts of documents so if i ever need to hire somebody or change something up i bring my binder to him and then boom i have it all set and ready to go so looking for an attorney just type in business planning attorney near me I guarantee you there's a ton of them. It's not scary. Do not use the scariness of LLCs as an excuse to not get started. In fact, you can actually form an LLC at any point in the year that you're doing business. So us, we started selling things and buying things in like January 2021. We didn't form our LLC until late February. So we had a whole month and a half of sales and purchases and expenses and all that stuff. All that happened is we just took all that and we threw it in the LLC. My uh, tax guy slash attorney helped me with that. It was super easy. So you don't, don't act like you need an LLC before you make a single sale. Do some business. Make sure, you're, uh, make sure it works. You know, Don't spend six to $900 on an LLC. If you think your business might fail, try it out first. Uh, sole proprietor. That's going to be a lot easier uh, to explain too. So sole proprietor. Really good for small side hustles. If you flip stuff uh, from garage sales on eBay, like I did for years, you can just be a sole proprietor. There's really no risk in it. You're probably not going to get sued. It's just easier, and you don't really need anything like too official to flip stuff on eBay. And and you can also be a sole proprietor if you mow lawns or whatever, sell lipstick, whatever. But um, basically, it's the same entity as you. So when you do your taxes. You go through all the normal W4, W2, whatever it is. You go through all your normal stuff. And then on like TurboTax, you'll see there's a section that says, hey, did you make any additional income in addition to your main job? You click yes, and then it'll send you like a Schedule C to fill out. It's TurboTax. You can't mess it up. And that's considered a uh, doing your taxes as a sole proprietor. So great for side hustles. It's free. You don't get any personal protection. It's with you but if you're doing something simple it might be a good way to start um yeah now we're going to talk about suppliers for your pokemon card business how do you get pokemon cards to sell where do you get them how do you get them at a good price number one official distributors so if you go to pokemon.com you can just google pokemon official distributors if you want it will get you to the screen i have here 
Um, it's literally a list of all the official distributors that the Pokemon card company works with all over the world. So you can literally call these people at any given time. A lot of times they won't answer the phone. A lot of them require you fill out a form on their website first. I didn't do that. I was just calling people. Um, for the most part, they will not work with you if you're just an e-commerce site. A lot of them require you have, have, to have like a brick and mortar. I'm obviously an exception. I have an e-commerce site. Um, I just got along with the guy. It was Southern Hobby, full disclosure. Southern Hobby kicks ass. But Alliance, I've also heard really good things about. And uh, what was the other one? Um, Peach State Distribution. I've heard good things about them. So the bad, it's hard to be, become a partner with a distributor, especially with an online store. You need to spend a lot of money up front, sometimes thousands of dollars per month to get their attention and get your account up. And uh, you won't get a lot of inventory that you actually want right away. The good, you have an official plug. Everything that you get from the distributor is going to be official. It's not going to be weighed or resealed or fraudulent. Everything's 90, a million percent good. Um, you can send them a resales, reseller's license, which will get, give you uh, tax-free capabilities. So it's really easy to get a reseller's license. I'll talk about it later. But the distributor will take that, put it in their, in their file, and then you can buy stuff tax-free, assuming you're going to resell it. Um, you're going to get the cheapest prices you'll ever see from a distributor. I'm talking booster boxes for like $85, which is super cool. And then the inventory is dependable. You can't get as much as you want. We talked about that, but you know exactly how much you're going to get and you can plan accordingly. I know I'm getting 200 something boxes of Crown Zenith. I can plan accordingly. Okay, so if the distributor thing is not going to work out for you, you can find a vendor. A vendor gets inventory from a distributor. So I would be a vendor for the American Pokemon Company. Um, sometimes vendors like me, like I said, we have to buy stuff that we don't really want. So in order to get my, uh, you know, palette of Charizard, I got a palette of Charizard UPCs I didn't really want. In order to get my Brilliant Stars booster boxes, I had to buy a bunch of Chilling Rain back when that set sucked. So in those situations, I might go, hey, I'm forced to buy these. If you pay me a dollar or two more than I'm paying, I'll look good to my distributor. I'll get my account balance up and then you can get inventory for a cheap price. So if you can find a vendor who is kind of in my position where we're just trying to build up our account, that would be the play. Um, I've got a lot of people I already sell stuff to in bulk, so don't contact me because I won't have enough for you. But it's a, it's a, good, a good thing to look into. Um, you're one slot down from a distributor, so you're going to be paying a little bit more probably, and you'll have trouble finding a reliable distributor, a reliable vendor who is willing to give away stuff near distributor prices. Uh, the good stuff, you have an official plug. Again, assuming the vendor is a relatively honest person, everything that he sends you or she sends you will be legitimate. You don't need to worry about all the BS that comes with working with a distributor. Um, all of that nonsense is dealt with because you're just a buyer. Super easy. I would say you have a 70-ish percent dependability ranking, which means you probably don't know exactly what you're going to get and when you're going to get it. Your vendor will probably contact you and go, hey, I have this much. Do you want it? Yay or nay? So not great. Okay, number three for suppliers, you can find a third party. For Japanese cards, uh, which is what I specialize in, you need a third party because the Japanese Pokemon card company does not work directly with Americans. In fact, if you look at the back of a Japanese booster box, it straight up says not to be sold in America or not to be sold outside of Japan. So for English stuff, um, you might find a third party who, you know, it's typical. You know, you go to a convention, you go to a Facebook group. This isn't complicated. Mercari, uh, you scalp stuff from Walmart. I don't condone that, but that's technically a third party. And you just buy from them and resell it. So if you find someone selling their collection, selling in bulk, Maybe they're running a sale, maybe they're going out of business, maybe they're at a convention, whatever. That's a source of, of supply. The bad, it's risky. You don't know these people necessarily. They could be fraudulent. They could have weighed packs, resealed packs, so do your due diligence. Pricing will certainly be higher than vendors or distributors, and inventory is not dependable. You have to always be hunting. The good, meeting fellow sale uh, sellers can lead to great relationships and opportunities. Uh, you have access to more unique products. So slabs and uh, singles and signed cards and all that good stuff. Distributors don't sell that stuff. Distributors only sell sealed products. So if you focus your business around singles and graded cards, well, you're in a whole different niche and that might be good for your business. You would need a third party seller in that case. Uh, the good cheap prices if you're a good negotiator and you find the right person at the right time in the right place. 
take advantage of any opportunity you can get. So now we're going to talk about buying inventory for your Pokemon card company so you can then sell it on your site. Credit cards. A lot of people think they need a business credit card. You really don't. All you need is a credit card that you do transactions for your business. So if you have like a Discover student card, that's all you really need as long as you don't commingle funds. So don't be going to McDonald's and buy an inventory. You gotta reserve that Discover card for your inventory, for example. Um, a really good website I'd suggest is nerdwallet.com. They have like every piece of data for credit cards you can ever imagine. They have comparison tools that are wonderful. Um, basically get a credit card with no yearly fees. If you are buying Japanese product, make sure that credit card doesn't have international fees or you're gonna lose a lot of money like I did when I started. Um, make sure the card has good rewards perks. If you can get points for your purchases, especially if you're making large ones, power to you, especially if it's a travel card, because then those points can be, um, you know, dedicated to, to airplanes and hotels and stuff, and you can take yourself on a nice vacation. Um, again, it doesn't need to be officially considered a business credit card. It can just be a credit card that you use for business. Business credit cards have their own perks. Go to nerdwallet.com. You'll read all about it. Uh, okay, uh, when you're selling inventory, another thing you want to consider is a reseller license. We kind of talked about this earlier. So this allows you to buy inventory tax-free. Most of the time, people aren't going to even know what this is or accept it. If you're buying from my store, I don't even know how to legally process that. So I, I don't know what a reseller's license is as a seller. I can't help you. Um, that being said, I don't really charge sales tax unless you live in Nebraska. So it's kind of a moot point. Uh, but... If you get a distributor, you will need a reseller's license. And how to get that, each state's a little bit different. You can go to Google how to get a reseller's license in Wisconsin, whatever. You'll probably find some good source. Call your tax guy, call an attorney. Probably if you have a tax guy you use every year, he'll just give you the information for free. Um, there might be a super small fee to pay, but for the most part, it should be a completely free process. It takes maybe two weeks once you start. And it's super easy. It's not scary. Don't be intimidated. Okay, when you're selling invent or when you're buying inventory, you want to make sure you're keeping receipts. Keeping receipts is very, very important. Um, you want to keep a receipt for every single thing you buy for the business, whether it is a computer to stream on, a camera to stream with, a microphone, headphones, a scale to weigh, uh, you know, your your shipments, boxes, bubble wrap, inventory, everything. Keep receipts for every single thing that you buy for your business. Um, if you're buying inventory at like a convention event or even a garage sale, you might not have access to receipts. The seller might not have receipts. That's not a problem. All you need to do is keep a good, clean record. So bring your phone or a notebook, whatever, and keep track of the who, the what, the where, the when, the why. Uh, you know, who did I buy this inventory from? Do they have a name or a company name? Uh, you know, what is the inventory? What's the name of it? Uh, how much did it cost? Where did I buy it? What day did I buy it? Keep records of everything. So if you get audited, you will have records of everything that did not have a receipt and your Gucci. I promise you this is all you need. When I was doing garage sale uh, flipping full time, that's all I had. Because again, garage sales don't give you receipts. Totally fine. Just keep, keep your notes. Okay, when buying Pokemon cards for your business, you want to take advantage of opportunities. Um, buying in bulk, that's an opportunity. It's likely going to be the only way you're going to get a good price on anything uh, that you can sell for a profit margin without scalping people. If the seller gives you a discount if you use PayPal friends and family or wire the money directly, do it if you trust the seller. Do your due diligence. But that small percentage of savings adds up a lot, especially when you get into the five, the six, and the seven figures of business. You will be very happy that you found someone trustworthy enough to engage in commerce with. Uh, make sure to always be ready. Keep your capital, um, keep enough capital where if an opportunity comes where you need that capital right away, you have it. I'm not a huge fan of keeping a ton of cash. Cash is trash. You're not building interest on it. I'd rather have the money work for me, but I always keep a couple tens of thousands of dollars laying aside in case maybe someone's selling a vintage booster box collection at a really cheap price. They're not willing to wait for me to pull the trigger. I have cash. Here you go. Now I got some. You want to be ready for opportunities. Um, you want to put yourself out there to buy inventory. Uh, you need to meet people, get on lists, join Facebook groups, attend conventions. 
anyone you want to you want to be that guy or that girl that people can contact if they have something for sale that's interesting and they want to drop it off on you if you are buying international like i buy japanese cards take advantage of um, the foreign exchange market so sometimes yen is this sometimes yen is that depending on where the yen versus us dollar is you can save some money that way chances are the seller the japanese uh the seller isn't following it a lot of people don't have that business acumen i do because i'm obsessive so if you can work with the foreign exchange rates you might save some money okay so that's how to buy pokemon cards for your business here is kind of a more in-depth strategy to buy pokemon cards for your business and that is to leverage debt free money is here use it so credit cards what are those well they're interest-free loans yes you heard that right a credit card is nothing more than an interest-free loan. It is the only way you're going to get an, a, a loan interest-free for 30 days from anybody. A bank ain't going to do it. Your friend ain't going to do it. Maybe your mommy and daddy will, maybe. But for the most part, you are not going to get an interest-free loan from anyone else. Now, you do have to pay interest if you take more than 30 days to pay it off, but we're not going to do that, guys. We're going to be responsible. So, couple safeguards if you want to buy inventory on credit before you sell. Number one, never take more credit than the amount of capital you have. If you have a thousand bucks in cash, do not spend a thousand dollars on a credit card. Spend maybe 500. You want to spend about half of what you have. So if shit hits the fan, you can bail yourself out before the interest starts accruing and you screw yourself. Um, buy inventory on credit that you know will sell within a month. So if you're, um, you know, if you're, if you're selling Pokemon cards and you decide, I'm going to buy a few Digimon booster boxes just to test the market, don't buy those on credit because you don't know how long it's going to take for those to sell. If you're selling Japanese Pokemon cards and you've got an opportunity to buy V-Star Universe on credit, there's a damn good chance you're going to be able to sell a few boxes in a month. So that would be a good example of something to consider to pay credit for and protect your capital. Um, if you're confident you're going to sell five boxes of E-Star Universe next month, buy five boxes on credit. When you sell two or three of them, consider buying more because you only have to pay, you have to pay the debt back 30 days after you make the purchase. So if you make your original purchase on January 1st, you have until February 1st to pay that back. But Let's say midway through the month, you um, accrued enough sales where you're like, I'm going to buy three more boxes on January 15th. You don't need to pay off those three boxes on January 30th. No, you have until February 15th now. Not bad, right? So you can kind of churn and burn these things. Be smart with it. Don't get yourself too much in a hole. You want to make sure if shit hits the fan, you have enough capital to bail yourself out. Taking advantage of pre-orders as an interest-free loan to buy Pokemon cards for your business. This is kind of an advanced strategy. I would suggest only doing this if you have a supplier you can rely on and trust with your life. So let's say you don't have a lot of capital, but there's a really good set coming out, V-Star Universe 2.0, coming out next month. You know people are gonna go crazy, but you only have 500 bucks to your name. You know you could sell $5,000 worth, so what are you gonna do? You're gonna go to your Japanese supplier and you're gonna go, hey, I have $500, can I pre-order um, 500 bucks at V-Star? He's going to go, yeah, but you're going to go, damn, you know, if I could pre-order more, they'd sell. So what are you going to do? You're going to put pre-orders on your website. You're going to go to your website, edit it, add the item. V-Star Universe 2.0 pre-order ships next month. People will buy that pre-order, and then you have their money. So now you have all this pre-order money. Now you can go to Japan, and you can go, hey, dude, I've got $5,000 of um, money here. Can I pre-order $5,000 of product? He's going to go, hell yeah. So then when the set comes out, he's going to send you the product and you're going to ship it to your customers. And you can rinse and repeat that over and over and over again. Um, again, kind of an advanced strategy. You, you want to only do that if you have suppliers you can trust with your life. And I would suggest doing it only if you have multiple suppliers you can trust with your life. I trust my main guy more than anyone else I know, but if he got hit by a bus tomorrow, I'd be screwed. So I have four other suppliers that I also trust very much, and they could bail me out in a sticky situation. Now we're going to talk about how to protect your inventory for your Pokemon card business. Don't get got. The most important things about protecting your Pokemon card inventory is security and insurance. People slack on the insurance part. It's more important than the security part, guys. 
because insurance will protect you if you do get robbed. And security, I mean, if a camera catches someone robbing you, chances are they ain't going to find them anyway. So insurance is the most important thing. But we'll talk about security first, ring, simply safe, um, video doorbells, whatever. These are great tools. Um, again, if someone gets caught on a camera, chances are in this state of the world we're in, nothing's going to happen to them. But those do serve as a deterrent. People make fun of my setup. They go, oh, those cameras suck. Those locks aren't good enough. Da, 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 da. Guys, it is physically impossible to keep a force out of a room. People have escaped Alcatraz. I know uh, a local game shop that got broken into. They had all this jail bars on the front of their building. It was completely impenetrable. Guess what they did? They broke into the building next to it. It was a strip mall. Broke into this uh, this eyeglasses company or something. And then they dug a hole through the drywall between the eyeglass company and the game store company. And they stole everything. There is no such thing as an impenetrable wall. Insurance, again, more important than security because if you do get your stuff stolen, at least insurance should get you your money back. Um, I would suggest collector insurance and not just normal inventory insurance. Uh, we use collectible insurance services. They're very highly rated. You can Google them. It's 160 bucks a month to protect a quarter million dollars of inventory. And this insurance, again, is collector's insurance. So it's going to protect you based on the market price of the inventory. So normal inventory insurance is going to look at what you paid for an item. And if it gets stolen, they're going to pay you that. That's not good in a volatile market like Pokemon. Okay, now we're going to talk about how to sell your inventory as a Pokemon card business and make that paper. So the first thing you're going to need to do is build a website. Building a website is super easy with like a drag and drop service. Wix is what we use. There's also Shopify and Square. These things cost like 20 to 30 bucks a month to process payments. They are super easy to use. You can set up a website in a couple hours on all of them. If you want to work with a designer um, on Fiverr, you want to work with an SEO, that's search engine optimization. They help your website appear on the top of Google results. If you want to work with them, that might be a smart idea if you have the capital laying around. Otherwise, start easy and cheap. 89% um, of our customers shop on our mobile site. There's only like 11% of people that go to the main site. So keep that in mind. You should be dedicating 89% of your time on your mobile site and 11% of your time on your main site. A lot of people do the opposite. They're on the computer, so they work on the computer site. No, work on your mobile site. Make that thing sparkle because that's what most of your customers are going to be buying from. Uh, is a site too expensive? You're not ready to make that move yet. Not everyone has $30 a month laying around, and I get it. So how do you sell your inventory? Well, you can post on Facebook groups. You can get yourself out there just to get started, build rapport with the community. Good to get some reviews. You can also make a Venmo Cash App PayPal account strictly for the business. Do not commingle funds with your current Venmo PayPal uh, Cash App account. You need a separate one, and that's whether you're an LLC or a sole proprietor. It'll keep things easy and clean. Um, another way to sell Pokemon cards that's essential is to have a niche, niche, whatever, and a brand. These things go hand in hand. See what I did there? Uh, so with a market as saturated as Pokemon, it does help to have a focus on what you offer. You can specialize in singles or slabs or sealed, player or collectors or investors, modern or vintage, Japanese or English or Korean, trainer cards maybe is your thing, Pokemon, Pokemon cards is your thing. Maybe you're loud and bombacious like Leonhart. Maybe you're more chill like I am. You need a, a niche. Who, who are you targeting and what do you want to be perceived as online? Now, you want to add that niche to like a personal brand. So me, I sell Pokemon cards and I'm kind of like a very transparent, um, breaking the fourth wall business person. So I make videos like this. Normal store owners don't make videos teaching other people how to compete with them. That is not a normal thing. That is a, a personal brand, a niche of mine. There might be people that uh, their their niche is they do comedy and sell. I know some comedians that sell Pokemon cards. Um, people that do pack openings. Maybe some, uh, what else do I got? Maybe some just follow the TikTok trends. They dance and they sing and da 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 some take advantage of sex appeal. There's a lot of uh, pretty attractive Pokemon people in the world, male and female, you know. Some of them, will, they flaunt their stuff. Some flex their expensive cards and vintage booster boxes. A lot of rich people, they'll flex their stuff. 
Um, some curse, some are like super real, Gary Vaynerchuk, that mug. And then some are more wholesome. They film with the whole family and it's kind of like a wholesome vibe that maybe other families would enjoy. You need to have a focus to stand out from the competition. You want to be, uh, you want to be a human behind the brand because it's so saturated. You need to stand out somehow. Attending conventions. This is a great way to sell cards and get your name out there. Face-to-face -face contact is super fun. You build rapport with your community and you build a, uh, a good little group of people that you can rely on and help each other out with the business side of things and just maybe trade some Pokemon cards and play the game, whatever. You might live near conventions. If you type in trading card conventions near me in 2023, if you live in a relatively large city, there's probably at least one or two in your area. Uh, any travel fees, if you have to fly or drive uh, or Uber, whatever, and stay in a hotel or whatever, all that stuff's covered as a tax deduction. So keep your receipts. Those are all write-offs, including the ticket to the convention itself. If you want to be a seller at the convention, you're looking at $300 to $500 per table, usually per weekend, if it's like Collecticon or kind of a bigger convention. If it's a smaller local convention, maybe $150, bucks, 200 bucks a weekend. Um, we had kind of a weekly mall thing. We had like a area at our mall where people, vendors could come in and sell product. It was like 200 bucks a week, a weekend. And then on the holiday season, it was 300 bucks a weekend for a table. So there you go. That table cost also a tax deduction. Keep your receipts. Um, here's another big tip for selling Pokemon cards at your business. Play with volume and play with margin. Sometimes cheaper prices are going to net you more. Here's an example. If you sell 100 boxes for $100, and say that's either um, average market price, or maybe you're even a teeny bit above average market price, you're going to sell 100 boxes. You, you made 10 grand in sales. Great. Well, what if you sold them at 90? What if you went a little below market price? You beat out all your competition. Well, if you're selling them for lower than everyone else, you're going to sell more boxes. In my example, you'd sell 120 boxes. I think that's an understatement. I think you'd sell 160 boxes. But 120 boxes times 90 is 10,800. You made 10,800 in sales. Great. Now you have to know, did you, how much did you actually profit, right? Like the, the profit's important. You might've profited less, but hopefully you made more sales where you can take that money that you quickly made, buy more inventory, and now you can sell that. Churning and burning is the name of the game, guys. Like, yes, I acknowledge that if you're selling them for 90 and you bought them for 80, you're making $10 less profit per box, but you're also able to cycle through inventory faster. And the faster you can cycle, the faster you can grab more, the faster you can make money. Now, cheaper prices are going to bring in more customers as well. That's another bonus. If you're undercutting everyone in the market and you're only making a few bucks on a box, that's okay because you're getting all this attention. Oh, Pokeyany has the cheapest prices on Vsar Universe. Wow, let's go check them out. Blah, 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 blah. You get publicity. Publicity brings more customers, and those customers hopefully yield repeat business, which just helps you in the future for hopefully the long eternity of your company. So um, as far as selling products for cheap to beat uh, the market, attract customers, maybe you want to churn and burn, only do that with inventory you can quickly replace. So if I have like 12 boxes of EV heroes, which are very hard to find right now, would it make sense for me to, to try to churn and burn those? Would it make sense for me to have a lower price than anybody else? No, because once my 12 EV hero sells, I can't realistically get more and my site will just be out of EV heroes. That doesn't make sense. With VSTAR Universe, I've got suppliers that can literally give me 200 boxes whenever I ask. That's why I was selling them for so cheap because I could sell them and get more whenever I wanted and I'm building more customers that way and overall I'm making more profit in the long run by generating more sales. Uh, so yeah, if you, if you have items you can't easily restock, don't, don't cheap out. Charge full price. That's fine. Loss leaders. Walmart does it, so can you. So a loss leader technically is an item that you lose money on to bring customers into your store. I consider a loss leader anything you break even on, whatever, personal opinion. Um, the point of a loss leader is to get people in your store, on your website, to buy a really trendy item, and then hopefully, you hope, while they're there, they buy more stuff. 
This concept is kind of officially coined to the target effect. We all know if you go to Target to buy a, a gallon of milk, you're probably going to end up coming home with a cart full of cute, unnecessary accoutrements for your house. That's what you want to do with a loss leader. You want to bring people in with something that's highly marketable, usually pretty cheap, and something you can put on TikTok and get people excited. So we have this really cute um, uh, Pikachu card with the three uh, starters from Gen 9. People love that card. It's 17 bucks on eBay. Everyone's selling it for $24. we are making a, a dollar per card, right? But we are bringing in a ton of people. And while they're on our site, they're going to buy other stuff, usually. Some people only buy the card. And in that case, I probably lose money after I ship it, pay for the uh, fees and all that. I'm probably losing money on that one card, but I got a new customer's email address, phone number, all this stuff, way to contact them. They're in my email list now. Buying, um, buying leads through advertising costs a lot more than just bringing someone to your website, even if they buy something you don't make a lot of money on. So find a loss leader that works. Just make sure if you're going to utilize the loss leader strategy, make sure there's other stuff on your site and it's stocked up. If you bring people to your site and you're losing 50 cents on every Pikachu card you offer and you have nothing else available on your site, that's just do stupid. You know, you make sure you have booster boxes available for them to add on to their purchase. Add-ons are essential. Bundles are bundles. Um, a lot of people don't know what they want. Raising Cane's has four menu items for a reason. It makes things easier. Bundles make things easier too, especially in a world as confusing as Pokemon, where there's moms and dads and grandparents buying for their kids, they might not know what they're looking at. Me, I sell Japanese cards, so my stuff's really foreign to people who are usually uh, buying English stuff or maybe people that compete in the TCG. There's an overwhelming amount, and they don't know what they are. They don't know which one to pick out. So I have an 8-pack variety pack, a 10-pack variety pack, and a 15-pack variety pack where you can get all the pretty different packs for a fair price. I made the bundles giftable. Uh, $20, it was kind of what you'd spend on a gift for your, your friend's birthday party when we were kids. Now it's like 30 bucks if you're going to your friend's birthday party. Um, people also like to spend 40 or 50 bucks depending on, uh, you know, situations. So I have a giftable bundle for all three of those price points. Small, medium, and large. Each one comes with different booster packs and combinations. You'll sell a ton of them using this giftable bundle strategy. And as a bonus, maybe someone never heard of uh, Sky Legends. Maybe someone never heard of that set. Well, if you include Sky Legends in your bundle and they get the uh, stained glass birds, they might go, oh, damn, this Sky Legends is dope. I'm going to buy a box of that tomorrow. So you're introducing them to new products while also selling products that you might not necessarily be selling very well. Bundles. You want to entice return business. People like discounts, people like loss leaders, people like marketing, and that attracts customers, and that's good. But what's equally important is getting return business. If you're getting a customer and they're one and done, that's good in the short term, but your long-term sales are going to suffer. So some strategies. When you, get their, uh, when you ship out their Pokemon cards, you include maybe a thank you note. Maybe you include a discount code for their next order. Maybe you include a freebie to show you appreciate them and they're most likely to come and return the favor. Um, you keep them on your email list, of course, and you market new products to them as they come in, new sales to them as they come in, new promotions. Just don't spam your people. Um, but yes, you do want to focus on repeat business. It's the only long-term safeguard for not going out of business. Okay, now we're going to talk about how to market your Pokemon card company in 2023. All about the tiki Taki. PokeTalk is real. Uh, we generated $100,000 in the first few months only making TikTok videos. We'd make about 12 TikTok videos a day, and no, people did not get sick of them. At least they never complained about it. So I know a lot of people who are watching this are using that as an excuse. Oh, I make two a day. Like, that's good. I'll make two every day, though. I'll stay motivated. Number one, you probably won't. You will probably forget. It's better to just make 12 in a row while you're motivated and just inundate the feed. There's a few reasons behind this. Number one, if you're inundating someone's feed, you are blocking out any other competition. If someone sees me talking about V-Star Universe every time they swipe, anyone else that's selling V-Star Universe is at the very, very bottom and the customer probably isn't even going to see their content. I own the feed 
And again, no one seems to complain. I've been doing this for two years now, guys. I was doing 12 videos a day for the first six months. Now I'm a little lazier and I shouldn't be, but I'm trying to work on that. You want to post as much as possible. Um, at the same time, you want to use like top trending music with your posts. Let's say you want to make a video where only it's your voice. You don't want to have music in the background for whatever reason. You should still go to the top trending songs on TikTok, add them to the video, and then you can go to the volume control. You can essentially mute those songs and the algorithm will still pick up that you chose that song. So if you hate uh, Britney Spears, Hit Me Baby One More Time, one, you're a psychopath if you hate that song, but two, you can put it, if it's the number one trending song, put it on your video, mute it, and then you still get credit for using Britney Spears. Not bad. Um, switch up content on your TikToks. You can't do the same thing every single time. Do pack openings, do rip and ship footage, trivia on Pokemon, uh, show off your reviews or review products, store hunting videos. People love watching people going to Target and buying Pokemon cards with their kids. Flex your vintage stuff, flex your expensive stuff. Flexing is actually one of the best ways to grow on TikTok, as douchey as it sounds, it does work. Okay, now we're going to talk about recycling and reusing content. TikTok is what I call a central hub for content. It has the ultimate video making experience. You can add music, you can slice and dice footage, you can add footage in directly from your phone, you can add captions, you can add subtitles, you can do all sorts of wacky stuff with it all on your phone. The best part is Instagram, uh, Snapchat, a bunch of other social media platforms sync with TikTok. So as soon as you get done making your TikTok video, not only one, does it get saved to your phone automatically, but two, you can automatically beam it out to a bunch of other social media platforms. And then you don't have to do jack. You made one video and it turned into many. Um, long form to short form is another big strategy when it comes to recycling and reusing content. Let's say you make a long form YouTube video of you doing a rip and ship or you opening a booster box for yourself. It's a 20 minute video of you opening up a booster box. Okay, 36 packs in an English box, right? Turn that long video into 36 little videos, right? So slice and dice, put it in Premiere, put it in uh, Final Cut, whatever. And no one's gonna wanna see your basic card pulls, but let's say you pull like five uh, ultra rares out of a, a booster box, you cut them, you make five short little uh, 40 second videos. And then at the end of each video, you have a little outro card that says, watch the full video here. And you have your social medias or your website or whatever. Um, you might as well take advantage of the long form content because people might not have the patience to watch it. They might not be on the platform to watch it, but they'd be happy to watch chunks. In fact, I'm following my own advice. This video here, you might be wondering why I keep repeating the word Pokemon business every time we start a new uh, chapter. It's because after I make this long video, I am going to go in and chop it up into little tiny chapters. And I'm going to make each one of those chapters its own video. And then at the end of each one of those videos, I'm going to say, hey, you want to watch the whole thing? Go here. Here's a link. Okay. At what point should you make ads for your Pokemon card company? Advertising is the same thing as marketing, except advertising costs money. That's the definition of advertising. So we started paying for ads once we hit like 500K sales. And honestly, um, they weren't that much more effective than just doing organic growth. Um, it's easier because you don't need to post. You can just make one ad and it kind of just goes. So if you're feeling lazy and you don't want to worry about going viral, okay, I guess that's fine. I wouldn't focus too much on it. Again, we waited months before we even advertised at all. Now I'm spending uh, like a thousand bucks a month on it, which isn't that much compared to other expenses I incur. It's fine. Um, I would consider an ad professional if you're ready to move on to the ad world. Chances are you suck at making ads, as do I. You'll spend money on the ad professional, obviously, but I would guess most of the time you're going to save more money hiring someone than uh, the money that you spend making a crappy ad that doesn't work. Okay, now we're going to talk about community building when it comes to your Pokemon business. It is the ultimate business strategy. People in the Pokemon fandom love other Pokemon people. It's just, we're just drawn together, right? So if you can build a place or a vibe where your fans or customers can get together and chat amongst themselves and with you, you will win the game. Give people a place to chill and trade and share information and talk about the anime and talk about other animes. Give them a place where they can meet friends online. 
a lot of folks in the nerdcore world are introverted. They might not have a lot of friends, at least that they can share their nerd stuff with. A lot of my friends, they're not really into my stuff, so I like having people on the internet that are into my thing. Um, you can make it a Discord, a Facebook group, whatever. If you want to do it right, um, you don't need, you don't want to be the ringleader. You want to be part of the community, not the dictator of the community. You want to keep the community safe from spam and fraud and cruelty. It is your responsibility as the Facebook group owner or the Discord owner to control any of that nonsense. Either get some people that will mod for you, um, hire somebody to do it, or just stay vigilant. Because again, it's your responsibility to keep your community a safe and healthy place. Okay, now we're going to talk about the importance of ripping ships when running a Pokemon card business. It's on a whole nother level. Ripping ships. We talked about community in the last slide. Um, ripping ships are a great way to build a community as well. People love getting together on a live stream to watch each other pull up some cool cards. It's also extremely lucrative if you do it right. Um, you'll need a way to grow a following first. Uh, starting out with ripping ships right off the bat, it's very challenging. You're going to have a lot of trouble. If you already have followers on social media or you already have a website with an email list, that is a huge advantage. If you don't have either of those, you probably need one of those if you're going to succeed. If I'm being honest with you, there is a ton of platforms to host your rip and ship on, and we're going to compare those right now. So one option to host your rip and ships, existing sales platforms, whatnot, drip, and network. These are platforms designed specifically for live selling and nothing more. The pros, they have a payment processor built right in because they're made for live selling. You already have lots of existing traffic on the app, so that's good, I guess. People trust sellers more on the app, even if they don't know the seller, because the app will protect them if they get screwed. And all you need is a phone. They're all just apps. You don't need any extra cameras or microphones or lights. You just need a phone. Cons, the fees can be high, like 11 to 13%, maybe more. Uh, it's saturated. There might be a lot of people on the app, but there's a lot of sellers on the apps too. And if you're not on there constantly and you don't have, uh, it, it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to stand out. You're going to have to work really hard at that. Uh, you don't own the customer list. These people are all buying through uh, Whatnot's payment processor or Drip's payment processor. They're not, they're not buying from your payment processor. You have information from them, but if the app like shut down randomly one day, you might lose a lot of those contacts and that could really harm your business. Your other option for rip and ships are generic streaming platforms such as Twitch, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. TikTok does have a selling element now, but we're gonna talk about generic TikTok. So the pros of using these generic streaming platforms, one, there's no commission fees because they're not made to be a sales platform. There's no fees. Um, you're your own boss, you own the customers. If uh, Twitch got knocked out for whatever reason, you still have all the folks that bought from you somewhere. Um, you have infinite customization. If you have like Streamlabs OBS, you can set up all sorts of crazy graphics and animations and this and that. The platforms have likely extreme longevity, so the chance of them going away is pretty damn slim. And generally, in my opinion and many others' opinion, they have a generally more um, chill vibe. I feel like a lot of sellers on Whatnot and Drip, and the customers like it, by the way, it's a little more bombacious, a little more capitalistic, uh, you know, it's very, uh, it's like an auction, it's an auction, and to me that's a little chaotic, and I prefer just chilling with some lo-fi music while I open my cards. Cons. It's harder to start, um, because you're on a platform that doesn't specialize in selling, so you're going to have to learn how to build a platform designated for selling. So if you're on Twitch, there's no payment processor. So you need to build a website that you can um, link from your Twitch. So in the Twitch chat, maybe you have a reoccurring chat message that says, go to this website to buy packs for the rip and ship. Maybe you have your Venmo account in the profile. Maybe you're just starting out. You want to do Venmo or Cash App. Also, it might take longer to build trust with people. You're just a guy on TikTok. You're not on an official payment platform. Nobody's going to um, protect the customer if you screw them. Now, if they buy with PayPal, they do have some protection. But in general, you're going to have to prove yourself a little bit more if you're just streaming on TikTok. Um, another con, you might need more supplies. If you're on TikTok or Instagram, all you really need is a phone. But if you're doing Twitch or like Facebook, you need good lighting. You need a microphone. You might need some cameras that go top down. You might need a face cam. You might need a stronger streaming PC. 
you, you might need to invest a little bit more. So maybe start with like TikTok and IG and move up to Twitch when you have some capital and some confidence. Um, both of these are all these are also saturated, guys. Uh, there's saturation everywhere. I think depending on your following and who you already have existing in an email list, that might not matter. But there is saturation everywhere, so you need to do something to stand out, and you need to be a nice person. Best practices for your Pokemon rip and ship. Keep your people informed of when you go live. If you have a Facebook group or a Discord group, notify everyone, hey, I'm going to go live at this time. Give them some time to prepare. Don't just go, I'm going live right now. Give them time to prepare. Uh, following is vital if, if you want to you know, have people in your audience right away. Uh, you want to show up on time and be prepared. Get your sleeves and your top loaders and your music and cameras and lights all set up before you go live. You never want to have a stagnant stream. So let's say you just start the live. People are coming in, but you don't have any sales yet. You don't want to just sit there until someone buys from you because if you're sitting there and you're boring, nobody's going to stay long enough to buy from you in the first place. They're just going to bounce, and now you have zero people, and then one might show up and go, oh, there's nothing going on. Now you have zero people again. If you're not getting sales, open your own cards. You're gonna, you're, you buy Pokemon cards already. You're already a Pokemon card fan. You probably have some Pokemon cards. Any Pokemon cards you buy at Target or Walmart, save them in a pile, and if you need them for your rip and ships, great, you have them. So now you're opening cards. People might go, oh, there's something happening here. Oh, wow, he pulled this card. Wow, he must have good luck. I'm going to buy from him. Maybe some people come in and think you're opening someone else's order, and they go, oh, wow, he's already got some business. I'm going to join the fun. Maybe. Um, another thing, you want to give love to everyone who shows up, guys. There are a ton of other Rip and Shippers and a ton of other entertainment streamers. If someone's watching you, you should consider yourself blessed. You have infinite competition. Thank your customers and thank your viewers just for showing up. Okay, closing remarks to this long-ass video about how to start a Pokemon card company. In conclusion, you need to be realistic. Um... I would say, like, you know those, like, drug or uh, athletic or whatever commercials that are, like, results not typical? I would say I'm the epitome of results not typical. It is very rare for someone to start a business and in two years do as much business as I have and end up on international television. That's very rare. That probably won't happen. Um, the reason I was able to do that was a little bit of luck and a lot of passion and time but I also took advantage of an opportunity, which was timing. So we started in like February 2021. The pandemic was in full fledged, so you couldn't buy cards in stores. Logan Paul just did this first edition box break, which was super viral. A lot of people got more into it there. And uh, I had someone in Japan that I kind of met and knew. And I was able to fill, fill that gap of the lack of English cards with Japanese cards. People were like, eh, I don't want to pay double on eBay for English. I'll buy this guy's Japanese. There was a lot of cogs in the machine that led me to my success. That doesn't mean you can't do it, but don't think it's going to happen that quickly. Most businesses fail within the first year, and most businesses aren't profitable for several years. Just keep that in mind and uh, be patient. Don't rush anything. Do not quit your 9-to-5 job uh, until you're making considerable money. I'm talking double what you were making. I did not quit my 9-to-5 until I was literally making double my 9-to-5 salary. Once that happened, I decided I'm going to quit. And I, in all honesty, it was only about 8 months. And I think that was probably a little bit fast, but it worked out. Thank God. Don't rush. Uh, last point, stay tuned for more. Uh, follow my YouTube channel, Pokeani underscore Pokemon. That's my channel for everything, Instagram, TikTok, etc. Follow that. We have a lot of other helpful business videos on how to start a Pokemon card company and just small business stuff in general. I hope you watch them and you learn something and I hope it gets you rich. If you're interested in Pokemon cards just as a fan or a competitor or an investor, go to pokeene.com. That's P-O-K-E-N-E.com. Poke Nebraska is what it stands for. I'd love to have you as a customer. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the mastermind. Follow, subscribe, like, comment, share, blah, 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 blah. Have an awesome night.